that's the only time you have a choice. Well, I need the negative energy. And you still don't really have it. It's cost prohibitive. Good morning, EOCC family. How are you? Nice wet day, very wet day. But I don't know about you, but it, the roads are turning a brownish color for some reason. I don't know how that's happening, but it was, um, they were definitely all over the road when I came in earlier. Welcome back, Doug. Welcome back, Danielle. You know, at first I thought Danielle left Doug there, but no, she said she brought him home. Um, before we get too much into it, I, I just want to, again, give a big thank you to uh, some of the gentlemen that, that did some painting out there, and I think some of them are here. Freeman's not here today, um, but is Jim here today? I don't see him either. Usually he's here. Well, I know um, Dick is here, and Dick, if you'd stand up. Peter, I know, is Peter Hilliard here today? Oh, there he is. He, stay right up for a second. The, <laughs> If you go into the library area, you'll see it all painted and, and absolutely beautiful, and furniture is coming. So uh, it's those four gentlemen that did all the work in there, other than cleaning up was Carrie. And as I said before, Carrie, Dory, and, and Allison cleaned the mess up to get that all done. So Anyways, it was a group effort. It's, it's wonderful to have it. And also, if you have been here during the evening hours, um, on the back building, there's now a new light that lights up quite a bit of the parking lot in front of that building. Uh, that was because of Bob Fago. And then if you're doing any uh, things here in the church that you might need coffee, the main machine downstairs is not working. We um, Somehow we blew a uh, heating element in the machine, so... It'll take a little bit to get a new element put in. I'm also looking for turkeys. I don't know who had the original list. I have a list signed up, but please call the... What? I said I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> I want plucked turkeys, though. Um, so anyways, we're still looking for seven or eight more turkeys to be brought into the church, already, already deboned and stuff. Um, so please call the church office. Let them know. We're going to add you to the list. Also, last week, I think it was Dory, you had the list for trunk or treat? Oh, Patty does. Okay. So, Patty, can you stand up and just let everybody know? We need people to sign up for trunk or treat. And if you haven't done it, haven't not yet d done it, um, see Patty um, right after the service. And, Patty, if you can come out with me at the end 
for a few minutes before you go down to the education meeting. That'd be great. <sighs> I think I got everything that I needed to cover. Dan, anything? You think? Okay, you're okay too. So at this time, we've been, we're, it's the month of Mar uh, October, and we're... <laughs> Okay, so, so I can't thank you guys enough for all the prayers for me this past week because I think Nancy needed them uh, really, really bad. Um, my my short-term memory is not there for some reason, but it'll get back good, I hope. And um, so I, I actually wrote my prayer out today because I'm afraid that if I start praying, I'm just going to say the same thing over and over again and not know it. So, so anyways, um, but thank you all for the prayers that have been uh, directed my way. It was, it's really nice to know that I'm loved. But at this time, we are celebrating Mission Month in October, and I'm going to invite Lynn and, uh, with Operation Christmas Child. Good morning. Ah, it's that time already again for packing shoeboxes. So I'm Lynn Hilliard. I'm the area coordinator. I volunteer year-round with Operation Christmas Child for our main central team here. Uh, that includes Penobscot County, Piscataquis County, Waldo, and Hancock County. I'm also our collection site coordinator right here at this church where all of the churches that help uh, pack shoeboxes and collect them bring them all here to our church to be loaded in the trucks. So I'm also in charge of that and I'm your project leader here at our church for Operation Christmas Child. So. Uh, today, I just wanted to show a short video that explains Operation Christmas Child, and then uh, Betty has a few words to say as well. She's on our Operation Christmas Child team. All right. Three, two, one. When that shoebox is open, they're overjoyed. You can see them shouting, jumping. Look at how much they are excited. This is the first time those children are receiving the shoe boxes. They are so happy. You can hear the laughter, you can hear the cheer, that excitement, it goes and goes and goes. Right now we're in Ukraine and today we've given out the 200 million shoe box to a little girl here. So it's a lot of fun. It's a privilege for us to be able to come and to help the people as much as we can. Every box is important because every box is an opportunity to tell a child about God's love, about His Son, Jesus Christ. There's so much joy that one gift box can give. They really experience the love of Jesus. At Operation Christmas Show, we celebrate something as simple as the shoe box because God uses it to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We got a full box on this this is such an amazing time. We're so happy to be here. This shoebox gift will impact a child's life all year round. We never dreamed we'd have an army of men and women who would come to make this program happen. This is what it's all about, telling others about Jesus. These shoeboxes go into 120 different countries where pastors and missionaries are going to use them to bring the gospel to kids. So you may think it's just a simple gift at Christmas time, but it's the gift of the gospel, the story of Jesus Christ. When that shoebox leaves that distribution center and it goes around the world, that's not just one person. That's the body of Christ joined together, delivering the good news of the gospel. They go by plane, they go by ship, they go by riverboat, they go by camels, they go by motorbikes. And these boxes go to some of the most remote areas of the world. And every box counts. After receiving shoeboxes, children are invited to participate in the Greatest Journey Discipleship Program. These children have just completed 12 lessons in the Greatest Journey. I believe that discipleship is the key, and they are now followers of Christ. They will tell their friends about Jesus. My name is Gladys, and I am nine years old. My friend Kemi told me I needed to go with her to church. I wanted to teach her about the Word of God. And when she came to my church, she received a gift box. For a long time, I asked my mom for a blanket. When I opened my shoebox, I found a blanket in it. When I came home, 
I showed it to my mom and she said it was great. I told her about Jesus. Now me, my mom, my grandma and Kemi go to church together. I am certain of one thing. God is my savior. Every box counts. Every box touches a child. It's like a snowflake. There's not one shoebox that is the same. And we are reaching millions of children with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you get the heart of the child, you will reach the heart of the parents, you will reach the heart of the family, and then you will touch the community. We are seeing churches being planted, and more and more churches are being built. We will do whatever it takes to reach the ends of the earth with the gospel. That gift box is the beginning into their hearts. Isn't it incredible how these gifts touch the lives of these children? The joy, the smiles, it changes lives. Every year we see tens of thousands of children disciple. And we couldn't do this without you, so thank you for packing the boxes. Thank you for praying for these children around the world. God bless you, and keep packing those boxes. So the shoebox is the vessel that gets the gospel to children all over the world. I was blessed in 2017 to go to Togo, Africa to actually give out shoeboxes. And I can tell you that the children, most all these children have never received a gift in their life. For many of them that have received shoeboxes that go on to tell us their testimony don't know what age they were because they had never celebrated, had birthday presents, Christmas gifts. And these kids need these things in the shoebox. They definitely do. And they were so excited about simple things like school supplies and a washcloth and toys and clothes and sunglasses and on and on. But the most important thing they receive is a presentation about the gospel of Jesus Right then and there, they can accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and they can go on to develop their faith through the greatest journey. Some children don't maybe accept Jesus at the time, but they later, when they do the greatest journey, accept Jesus. All children receive a shoebox, no matter what their decisions are, and every child is super excited uh, to get this great gospel booklet that goes with their shoebox in their own language. They hear the gospel, they get the shoebox, they get invited to learn more, and they get their own booklet. And many children I saw were reading their booklet after they had received their shoebox. I can help explain uh, downstairs for those of you that may never have packed how to pack a shoebox and what things to include. It's very important to include a note a Christmas card, a picture. The children really want to know about you. They can't imagine why someone they don't even know would pack them these gifts and share this with them. So that's very important to include. It's $10. We say it's for shipping, but as you may know, you could not ship this shoebox, even in the United States, for $10. It actually helps provide the booklet and the training for the teachers and pastors that teach the gospel as well. Um, now, for here, we would like everyone to bring their shoeboxes by November 12th, as we'll do our dedication here. If you're not able to actually pack a shoebox or shop, and you want to do a shoebox, we can do them online, and that's on our website, and I can share that with you as well. And we're having a packing party coming right up on Saturday. Uh, that's free to anyone that wants to come. We have all the supplies, and we'll be packing hopefully at least 150 shoeboxes, so uh, all are welcome for that. Um, it is really a wonderful thing to do to be sharing the gospel because we, as a body of Christ, are helping to save souls of children. And these children share it with their family, with their friends, and churches grow, and it just multiplies. We also on this side of the shoebox have a way to share and witness to others about Jesus Christ as well. So it works both ways, this side of the box and that side of the box. So Betty wanted to share just a quick testimony. The Lord 
We say, please pray when you pack your shoebox because the Lord has specific things he knows the child needs. So pray as you pack and continue to pray for the box to arrive safely. The stories of answered prayers through these shoeboxes are too many to count. A little girl prays for a dress. There's a dress in her shoebox. A little girl prays for pink shoes. A child prays for shoes. A child receives socks so he can complete his school uniform and go to school. A child gets pencils in their shoebox and now they can go to school. It's amazing to me that out of 10 million shoe boxes, God gets the right box to the right child. And this is just one of those stories. <clears throat> it says, people sometimes wonder if these gifts given with such love really get to those who need them. We received a letter about two boys in a cancer ward in Manila, Philippines, where a distribution took place. One boy had his right leg amputated. The team was sad because when he opened his box, it contained a pair of shoes. They prayed and asked the Lord to please help the boy deal with the realization that he would never again wear a pair of shoes. When they learned the, the boy in the next bed had his left leg amputated, they cringed as he opened his box. He pulled out a pair of socks. The moment was tense for those watching. Then the boys began to laugh. These two souls traded one sock for one shoe, and together they found humor and satisfaction in seeing their individual needs met. We may not see the purpose in something, but God has overseen the delivery of two boxes that were just right for these two boys who needed a glimmer of hope, a bond of friendship, and a lesson in finding joy. And that happens over and over and over. Thank you. So we will have shoe boxes downstairs that are available for you to take. And please, any questions, uh, let me know. Money donations are always accepted to help with the shipping for our packing party boxes. And thank you all. God bless you. We've been doing this here since at least 2004. And we have helped thousands of children to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So thank you. And before we invite the light of Christ into our sanctuary, um, God's house, I did forget that we are going to have a baked bean supper. It's now going to be on the 21st of this month. Um, so I hope you can join us for that. That's from 4.30 to 5.30. And this supper in particular, you're going to have a choice of three different types of beans. So uh, Vict Victoria, no. That, yeah, I know. It, yes, I can blame my thing. Okay. And, and the Hopkins and I will all be making beans. So come and enjoy three different types of beans and casseroles and uh, other things on the 21st. So <sighs> let us, God's people, just breathe. Know that the Spirit of God is with us, in us, above us, below us, and on both sides of us as the light of Christ is brought into today's service.
Let us, God's people, now gather together and be in the spirit of prayer. And if you're at home watching on Facebook Live or later on YouTube or whenever, I encourage you to just take a moment and, and sit back because the same spirit that is present with us right now is present with us wherever we go, is also present with you at home. Through the Holy Spirit, we are one in the body of Christ. Whether we're at home, at work, maybe even at somewhere else, as you watch this, we become one. So let us, God's people, join as one and offer our prayers to God. Gracious and holy God, almighty Lord, you are a God of love and you also a God of where the eternal hope stems in and from. Almighty God, we come before you and before you in your presence and we, we lift up our lives and our prayers by the hope and the peace found in your grace. We gather as your children seeking your wisdom, your strength, and forgiveness. This morning, O oh Lord, we pray for the nation of Israel and that entire area. But we pray for Israel, a nation that we know is dear to your heart. We ask for your protection and guidance over the people in that area, that they may know your peace and the security in the midst of turmoil. We pray for the leaders of all sides of this beginning of this conflict in this region, that somehow they may seek a peaceful resolution and pursue justice as you did with deep compassion. Father, we lift up those in the Ukraine region, both the Ukrainian people and the Russian people. For the Ukrainian people have faced immense challenges amid the conflict. Father, we ask for you to bring comfort to those that are hurting. Healing to those that are wounded and hope to those that have been displaced on both sides of this war. We ask for your wisdom and strength for those working to bring peace. We ask for endurance to never give up, knowing that you hear our prayers and you are with us. Father, we do seek and we look to you for forgiveness for the times when we failed to love our neighbors as ourselves, for harboring hatred or, or prejudice in our hearts. Lord God, as you tell us to do, we do repent of our sins. And we seek your forgiveness that we may be vessels of your love and grace in this broken world. But also a world of beauty and grace and love and deep fellowship as we share here at East Orienton. Lord, we pray for this church family. The family that is brought together through your son, Jesus Christ. We pray for those that are near and those that are far. We pray for those that are watching through media that they may continue to be a light in our community, sharing your love and compassion with all those that may be in need. Guide us in our missions and the endeavors that we may be fruitful and bring glory to your name. Father, we once again, we intercede and pray for our president and all elected officials. Pray for the leaders around the world. We pray that you grant them wisdom and discernment and a heart for justice. May they lead their people with humility and compassion, seeking the well-being of all people under their care. Father, we remember our military, our soldiers, the firefighters, police, and the frontline workers, and all the families involved who selfishly serve to protect and care for the communities in which we live. Protect them, Lord, as they open themselves to unknowns and danger each and every day. Finally, Lord, we remember your teachings where you tell us to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us. So, Lord, we pray for those who oppose us or 
harbor ill feelings towards us. Soften our hearts, O oh Lord. Break down the walls of division. And may reconciliation and peace prevail. Father, as we gather for worship, we know the Holy Spirit has filled this place with your presence. Grant us the grace to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, I welcome back the travelers, Danielle and Doug, and Lord, we, we rejoice that they return to us safe and sound. Also with new stories that they can share. Father, may your word pierce our hearts, bring in transformation and renew commitment to follow you faithfully. Lord, we lift these things and all things to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we also come before you remembering the prayer your Son taught us to pray that says, Our Father. Amen, indeed. If you'd remain standing and join us on our first hymn, Blessed Assurance, found on page 317.
Amen. Please Amen. be seated. So usually when I come up here, I have a Bible verse that I'd like to share with you, but I, I don't have one this morning. I'd like to tell you a story. This morning I got up early. Ernest Hemingway says that old men get up early so that they could see one more sunrise. Well, I didn't have very good luck this morning. My wife and I went out shopping. We went and got breakfast. We had to go to Lowe's because my wife is way behind on her yard work because of all the rain. But you know, as we got in and out of the car, and we went to a couple different stores, we didn't look over our shoulder in fear. I have several guns at home. I didn't, I didn't bring one with me this morning. We didn't have to worry about bombing. We didn't have to worry about people doing violence to us. And I would just challenge you to think about this this morning. That trip to my wife and I was nothing. We didn't count it as a blessing. But try making that trip this morning in Gaza. Try making that trip this morning in parts of Ukraine. Try making that trip this morning in Afghanistan. Folks, we live for whatever weaknesses and shortcomings it may have. We live in a most blessed land. And we need not to be afraid to give of those blessings. So I would ask the ushers and deacons to come forward to take today's offering. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you this morning. 
with hearts full of praise. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your grace and your strength that you bestow upon us every day. And Lord, we just ask right now that you would take these offerings and that you would multiply them and that you would use them to your purpose and that these offerings might bless others. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. whole front is open. Come on down. Chelsea, did you get the bags? Okay. Okay. Oh, they have slime. They made slime down in Sunday school. I, I, doing what? Oh, we talked about not ruining the church floor. Okay. Well, we just sang a song that we're all one, so. 
Uh, today's reading, folks, comes from the book of Matthew, and it's a great story. It comes from Matthew 21, verses 33 through 46. Powerful words we're about to hear, and, but before we do, we join together in a unison prayer. Lord, upon the pages of this book, So we're in this part of Matthew's gospel, and he's teaching the people before he makes the final journey to the cross. But he's in Jerusalem, and he tells them another parable. Matthew 21 tells us, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. fruit. The tenants seized the servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them. More than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of, out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He'll bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parable, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. This is the word of the Lord for our growth and our better understanding of who we are in Christ. Amen. So upstairs, uh, Patrick, I'm going to start off with those. I don't know where else to put it. So, um, but I, 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 I was listening to a podcast quite a while ago, and, and they were talking about um, words and, and puns and jokes that use words that can make you think differently or, or, or have that, oh, I get it. Have you ever, you know, like a pun? And sometimes you don't get it at first, and then 20 minutes later, it's a, <laughs> I got it. Um, well, I, I have a couple that I want you to think about it this way. And so my, my first question to you, my first riddle is, oh, wow, okay, great. They changed it on me. <laughs> Thank you. How long did Cain hate his brother? As long as he was able. Good job. I think that was, was that you, Betty? You get, the, you get how he played on words there, right? Okay, there's another pun coming. I know there is. What kind of lights were on Noah's ark? Floodlights. Awesome. <laughs> Dick, you win on that one. Was that you, Dick? Nice. Oh, it was both of you. Okay. Okay, do we have another one up there? Oh, I know this one. Why do cows wear bells? Oh, their horns don't work. Hey, you gave that one too quick. Come on. <laughs> do, do you see how that worked on words? You know, their horns don't work. Okay. Do we have any more? Oh, we do. Well, I love this. We're just going to do a comedy routine. What, why did, oh, I like this one. Why did King David love music? Because he enjoyed singing in his reign. 
Get it? Get it? Okay, Nancy and I sing that song all the time, don't we, Nance? Singing in the rain. Oh, wait, how did Moses make coffee? I know this one. He brews it, right? Okay, we have one more. Need a boat? I know a guy who has one. Pretty, f- hey, hey, that's very good. Pretty funny, honey. Uh, hun, uh, huh? I can't read, but that's okay. See, when the, pod brought the podcast and when you're speaking this, I, I knew that sometime I would use this somehow, and I put it in the back of my recollection, like recollection. And I'm glad it was quite a while ago because recently I don't think I'd remember it. But so it was there. And so as I read this passage, happening is you're making a new connection. You're, you're, you're making a connection that, that in that moment of, oh yeah, I get it, Noah, that guy, remember, you know, and so it, it's, it's, he talked about how it makes a connection that you might not otherwise think of the word. Now, that Noah guy comes to my mind, why did, why did, were the, why were the chickens punished on the ark? Because they used foul language. So, you know, all these things, how they're using different words. Dan, Dan came to me this morning and said, you know, I have a game on my phone that takes 16 words and you try to break it into four to make sense of the words. And sometimes the words, they don't fit unless you really look at the word in a little bit different light. And in fact, he said that he wasn't able to get this one and his wife gave him a clue. Don't look at the word for what you think it means. Well, see... When we make new connections in this way, we're taking the ordinary word that we, we think of often, and we, we get, and it kind of disrupts our thought process. You know, Noah, you know, we think of him as, as the leader of the ark, but we can use it in different ways, and a kind of a new connection happens in these words. The brain, in those moments, I believe our brain, when, when you have those 16 words, our brain looks for the gaps, how to put these together. And we look in the gaps of the word, not just what the word means. Sometimes our experiences make connections in a different way. You know, recently, as many of you know, I I hit my head pretty hard and and I was kind of loopy and don't really remember much of Monday. But in this connection, I, I made a connection with football. Because I always think, you know, back in the day, if you had a concussion, it was suck it up, buttercup. And, and do it. I, right, that's your line, right? Um, so, so we, but this made a connection with me because all of a sudden I felt a connection to why they have new rules, why there's a protocol in football that they, they say, no, no, I don't think you should be playing for at least a week minimal. And so sometimes our experiences can make a connection that we wouldn't otherwise have. Stories can make a connections and our, 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 And songs can make connections for us. See, Jesus told a lot of stories. If, if you pick up this book and you read it, this incredible book called the Bible, he told a lot of stories, and I think he told them for the same reason, to make us think and see a little differently, to make new connections, even though it's something that we've already read a hundred times or, or whatever. The Bible comes alive when we start reading beyond just the words and we start looking within the Spirit. A new way, and, and, and the passage that we read today from the parable of the, the nasty tenants or the wicked tenants, however you want to put it, that's what happened to me, that, that there's something that, that spoke to me a little differently. I made a different connection, but a lot of times in the scriptures, it was like, oh, that's what he's saying. In our Bible study, a lot of times, Betsy is, is known for, well, I would have never read it that way. But sometimes we see the same things, the words, and, and because of discussions, we make a connection with them, like the puns do with different words. And at times, it will t- change our expectation or our assumption of what we're supposed to see or think, and, and maybe we'll even look at the world a little differently. So this passage that, that I read today, and, and like I do a lot of times, I, I try to put myself in the story a little bit, but... Being a follower of Jesus Christ, and if I put myself in that time, think about if Jesus came up to us and said, 
the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. See, I can see myself saying, hmm, that kind of caught my attention. What, what, what's next? Or what is he going to come up with this time to make me think differently? And Jesus told me, I told all these stories, and especially in parables, to test our assumptions of what do we really think. Not what the world thinks, but what we think. And to be honest and to really kind of look into a mirror and, and, and see what God is asking us in our life. Unlike puns that you get it and you make that little groan or a little chuckle, Jesus' stories is, are not a one and done, oh, I get it. Because I tell you, as, as you get it and you go deeper, you're going to get it again and again and again. And that's why I believe it's called the living word of God. Over and over again, he'll speak to us, even if we've already read it. And so Jesus' stories are not just a moment for clarity. It is a lifetime to become more clear. And so the parable I just read, the, the wicked tenants in the vineyard, it is such a story that, that I'm speaking of. And it's a story that, that we have to come back to on a regular basis. And, and through the lectionary, every three years we'll hit this story if we want. And so Jesus tells a story about a landowner who rented his property, which was a common thing, by the way, in that time period. He'd rent out the property, and he'd go away and work on another property. But harvest time comes, as we know the story, and the owner sends his servants to the tenants to collect what was due, what was rightfully his. He gave it to us. As Charlie said in the service, what are we giving back that rightfully belongs to God in the first place? But he sends his servants, and they're unwilling to part with anything. And so they kill the servants, and maybe thinking that we'll show him who's in charge. We'll show him in a violent way. And this happens over and over again until he finally sends his son. And they take him out of the vineyard, which, again, if, if you're following that who the son really is, that's what the Jews, the, people, the Roman government did. They took him out of the city. And here it tells us in verse 39, they took him out of the vineyard and they killed him. But it's verse 40 that got me this time, that started speaking to me. Because a lot of times we read this, we, we think about, you know, it's obvious, who, who, you know, who is the land owner? God. We often hear that. And, and the son is Jesus. And who are we? The what? The servants. Or are we, are we the prophets going? Or are we the tenants that are killing the prophets? You know, so you can look at it both ways. But see, reading this this time, that, that pun got to me again because basically what I hear is a question that Jesus asked. After he tells them this thing, he says, Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? See, all of a sudden, I didn't jump in any of those things that he talked about. I was the one hearing the question. What are you going to do about it, Carl? When you look in the mirror and you honestly ask, here's, here's a bunch of people that killed your, your servants, killed your son, and you look in the mirror and, and what's your answer going to be? I'll show them. Especially if, if you're the landowner, if you're the owner that has power and might that you have an army that you can basically at your disposal. And here's what they say. Now this isn't coming from Jesus. This is coming from those listening and their assumptions of the world around them. This should be the answer. He will bring those wretches to a wretched end and he will rent the vineyard to someone else who will give him his share of the crops at harvest time. This is what the tenants Say, this is not what Jesus is saying. In fact, we know the story of what God, the owner, actually says the answer should be. See, there is a song by David Phelps that I, I played before way back. And it, it's called, uh, David Phelps called, um, The End of the Beginning. The End of the Beginning. And, and it's one of my favorite songs. And it's, and it's a story. It's a thing where he's sitting in the airport and he's reading the Bible and he's telling somebody that comes up and he, 
he reads them this part that says, he was a, born of a virgin on a holy night. And he tells them that he walked on waters and he healed the lame and, and, and the possibilities of new connections that God will give you as you read these stories. And the man, well, the, David Phelps re- keeps singing. And he says, and the bad part, the part about it is this man never did anything wrong. And the crowd chose him to die. And that was the end of the beginning. And the man that's hearing this says, wait a second, I've heard all this before. It's not a new book. That's the Bible. And the song goes, but there's more to it. That is simply the end of the beginning. Folks, this thing we call the Bible, the Word of God, is is not a, a pun to get one time and done. It is a thing to thrive on, to learn, to grow into even deeper and deeper, to live into. The story, that song, David Felt says to the man who says, it's just a book, I've already read it. He says, well, let me read it again. Listen closely, and it will change your life. In the parable of the tenants, I don't believe we are the tenants We are those that are hearing this story. And we are asked, as an owner, what should we do? See, again, we know what they said. But what did Jesus say? See, God's story is where we throw aside our expectations and assumptions that this is what should happen. And Jesus is teaching us, no, there's a better way. It might not make sense to you, but there's a better way. The ending God wrote is one where we can learn to live in a new way. A new way to live in this thing we call the world. A way where mercy topples hatred. Where reconciliation and forgiveness happens instead of us seeking revenge. That's what the tenants said, the the people listening. You go and you kill them. That's what they deserve. God, I believe, shows us that love does and can and breaks the cycles that can lead to more violence. See, when we forgive, when we start loving, that that, that cycle of, well, get back at them, that revenge breaks. And it makes no sense other than you can play it on Jesus Christ. Because as Christians, what are we supposed to grow into? To be more like who? More like Jesus. See, live out of God's future instead of constantly going over the tragedies of life over and over and over again. See, we're called to live out God's future. His answer, not what should be the answer in our world. This parable asked me, very carefully, do I have any stories that I need a different ending to? Or is it just going to be the same old thing? You know, we all have those stories, I believe. What story in your life do you need a different ending? Is, is it that battle that you're having with your neighbor? Is it a family member? Is it a loved one? Whatever it might be. What is, the, what is that happening in your life that you need a different ending? And any situation that is simply meeting your expectations or the assumptions that you think will just go in a circle over and over and over again. But I I encourage you to listen to this gospel. Reread it. Because what Jesus is telling us is allow God to write you a new chapter. Allow God to write you a new beginning. Let us end that one and start anew. An end to the beginning In Christ. Jesus asked the people, so how do you think this story should end? They say, kill him. Crucify him. And today, I believe Jesus asks you and I to look in a mirror and ask you, how are you going to end this story? How are you going to end your story? Is it going to be in the favor of love, forgiveness, mercy? Compassion, the fruits of the Spirit, or is it going to be according to the law and the people around you 
that says, get back at them. See, this passage is wonderful because it challenges me personally. Look in the mirror and make that decision. How's the end of your story going to look? Amen. So our last song today, we're going to be singing verses 1, 2, and 5. 1, 2, and 5. Patrick. So if you'd sign, Church is One Foundation. I'm going to play off Charlie and the message today. We are a blessed people. This church family is a blessed family. We, we have a place where we worship and fellowship, where I do believe love reigns and mercy and compassion are the answers. But I think the question that Jesus asks us personally can also be asked of the church. I was at a conference last week, last Saturday, and all I heard throughout the conference was how the churches are dying, how things are happening. And I'm thinking to myself, and, and I said to them that while we're not as strong as I ever want to be, but the Spirit is working here. I said, maybe each of us as pastors need to get back to the word and God's, Jesus' two commandments, to love thy neighbor and love thy God with all your heart and all your mind. Those are the things that we need to preach, not hate. And if we only have one person hearing it, that's better than having 150, 200 people hearing hate. So the, today, I'm going to put it before you, and Dan and I and all of you, will have work to do because I believe God is asking the church, what is the end of your story? What is the end of this church's story? Are we just going to fade away? Or are we going to fight like heck to say, we are one in the spirit. We are one in love and we need to spread that word. So I encourage you. I encourage you over and over again. Invite your family. Invite your friends. Get them on to the Right Now Media. If you need help with that, let me know. Start spreading the word and spreading the hope. You can't give them faith, but you can give them the mustard seed through love. 
So what is the story in this church? And how are we going to write it? Are we going to write an ending or a new beginning? In Christ, I know we have everything we need. We have eternal life, eternal hope, and we have each other. One body and one Lord. Amen. Amen. Hey, Doug, what time did you get in last night? From 11.30 from Greece. See, when I heard he was coming in that late and he planned to be here this morning, my heart jumped. Doug, I'll be honest with you. I said, this church family made the right decision because he has the heart of service and to worship. And we can't ask for anything more. It might not be where I want it to be yet, but I know we have the right person leading the charge. So Doug, welcome home, and may we all go downstairs and celebrate in the fellowship of love and the peace of Christ. Amen. Amen. You want to blow it out for me?